15 top tips you should know about buying a house in Ireland in 2023, whether you're a first time buyer, second hand buyer, or buying from overseas. In this video, I'm going to go over 15 top tips and insights as quickly as I possibly can. And in the interest of speed, I'm going to assume that you already have your deposit saved or you're working on that. I'm not gonna go through saving tips because I think there's lots of videos out there already on that topic. However, tip number one, I would advise on focusing more on increasing your earnings over your savings. Many of the saving tips that are out there for saving for your deposit skip over the fact that increasing your earnings has more of an impact on your borrowing power than your actual savings does. An extra 5K in savings increases your budget by five grand. A five grand increase in salary increases your buying power by about 20,000. Tip number two, build a team. Buying a house does not have to be overwhelming. You can build an experienced team of experts around you. There's no need to become an expert yourself and spend hours on reading and getting books and studying up on the market. Engage with a broker for your mortgage, a solicitor for your legal advice, and line up a surveyor so you're ready for when you go sale agreed. If you also plan to buy a house that needs a lot of work, line up a contractor who is available to give you estimates on the cost of that work and also attend viewings. Build a team that you trust, you don't have to learn everything about the property market, and it also looks very good when you actually put in the bid that you have a team already assembled. Number three, lending rules are changing in Ireland in 2023, which will allow for a 10% deposit across the board. First time buyers will be able to borrow four times their gross income, and second hand buyers will be able to borrow up to 3.5% their gross income. This will allow for increased borrowing within the market. There is a view that this will push up prices even further. However, this will probably be offset by the fact that interest rates have crept up over the last year. Try not to overthink the central bank's rates. Think about it this way. If rates were lower, there's a good likelihood that the price of the property would actually be even higher. As they say, marry the mortgage and date the rate, i.e. if rates do come down in the future, remortgage at that point. Tip number four, write down your needs and wants. A tree bed might be in need, but an ensuite, a large garden, off-street car parking might be additional bonuses and they might be wants. It's important for you to know your needs and wants so you can rule in and out properties quite quickly. It saves you from bidding on properties that don't meet all your needs. And it's also important that you don't get too attached to some of your wants when you are bidding on a property as well. Tip number five, desktop research. There's a lot of information that you can find out online before you go and view the property, including details on development plans from the local councils, flood plans, and also you can get all the past sales from the price registry. As a bonus tip, it is hard sometimes to search the price registry for certain types of properties. So what I would suggest is you can actually download the entire registry onto an Excel format, and you can easily search the properties by address within your own Excel. Tip number six, do drive-bys at different times of the day. This can tell you a lot about the area and what traffic might be like. Perhaps there's a school in the area and traffic can be really bad in the morning, or perhaps there's offices or retail and there's deliveries, etc., that could add to traffic in the morning as well. It's also important to drive by at weekends because sometimes parks or local sports grounds can cause huge parking issues in the area. Tip number seven, viewing the property. Pay attention to freshly painted rooms. It could be hiding up damp stains or something else. Look for other evidence of perhaps staining on the carpet, etc. if the room has been freshly painted. A good agent should be showing a property in its best light. If it is during the daytime and all the lights are on, this could be an indicator that the house is quite dark. While on the viewing, open and close some windows and doors to make sure they work. If they are difficult to close or get stuck, this could be an indication of more serious issues in terms of warping or perhaps settlement issues. Ask the agent as many questions as you can about the property at the viewing. Also ask why the owner is selling and if they need to sell quickly. The agent shouldn't be sharing any personal information about the seller i.e. they're getting divorced and that's why they want to sell or they're expecting and they need a bigger house or perhaps someone's got a new job and they need to relocate. All of this is very personal information and shouldn't be shared at a viewing. However, Irish agents tend to be very open about this and tend to overshare. So if you ask and they do share, perhaps you can use that to your advantage later on. At the viewing, also note the properties that have sold in the area recently, ones that you've perhaps noted from the price register, but see if there's any similarities with the property you're looking or any differences, i.e. has the property been extended or is there a bigger garden to perhaps to justify some price differences as well. 
ask the agent about recent sales in the area, even mention one of the properties that you've noted on the price register, ask them for their view on recent sales. They probably have looked into most of the recent sales in the area if they are advertising this property for sale, and they'll probably have a fairly good idea on price per square foot, and they might share this information with you, and also share some additional information on other sales as well. Tip number eight, build a rapport with the sales agent. It's important to remember that the sales agent is acting on behalf of the seller and not you. The sales agent's interests are in line with the seller and not yours. But sales agents are people too, and it's important to be nice to them and try build a relationship with them. Ask how they are, ask if they're busy, ask what is the best way to contact them, i.e. phone, email, or text message. If you are interested in the property, let the agent know, and let the agent know that you will be contacting them in a certain set time frame, and stick to that. If you're not interested in the property, let the agent know as well, and let them know the reasons why you're not interested in it. This can be helpful for two reasons. One, the agent can go back to the seller and advise them why certain people aren't interested in the property or why bids aren't coming in. And two, it also gives you the opportunity to inform the agent of what you are looking for, and perhaps the agent might be aware of another property coming up, and the agent only gets to know this by you letting them know. Try not to get on the bad foot of the agent because in the end of the day, they're the ones who have to recommend your offer to the owner. Many buyers believe that they'll upset the agent or the owner if they put an offer in below the asking price. However, if you've done your research and you feel that an offer of 10% or 5% below the asking price is appropriate, generally this won't do you any harm. If the property has been on the market for less than six weeks, the likelihood is your offer will be rejected quite quickly. If the property has been on the market for more than eight weeks, the likelihood is they may entertain your offer and perhaps the agent will discuss your offer with the seller. And in a lot of cases when this low offer comes in, it spurs a lot of new offers to come in as well. And sometimes even if the property has been on for eight weeks, the low offer coming in, when other people find out about this, there's a flood of offers then on the property, which sometimes people believe that are fake bids. But this is just the nature of things. A lot of people wait till the first person bids and then all of a sudden there's a flood of offers come in. So in most cases, the agent won't mind you putting in a low ball offer. One thing that might annoy some agents and it was a popular technique taught by those property gurus was to drop personalized letters into homeowners or sellers in certain areas and try bypass the agents. This tactic has now been used by some buyers to bypass the agent and this won't win you any favors and the likelihood is even if you are the top bid, the agent will be very slow in terms of recommending your bid. This is not the same tactic as love letters. Some buyers do include some love letters with their bid when they're bidding on a property. And it was quite common in the US for years, but it has now been seen as an anti-discrimination tactic in a lot of cases and has been outlawed in a few states and agents in the US have been advised not to accept such letters anymore. But if these love letters are written well, they do work for some buyers. I did write about the danger of these love letters for sellers and for agents within the SESI journal this year, and it is becoming more and more common for Irish agents to be more mindful and more wary of such letters in terms of the dangers that they could bring about from an anti-discrimination point of view for both agent and seller. Tip number nine, methods of buying. There are a number of methods to buy property in Ireland, ranging from auction, private treaty, public tender to private tender. But generally from a residential point of view, the most common way to buy property in Ireland is by private treaty, which probably makes about 80, 90% of the sales in Ireland in any one year, depending on how buoyant the market is. The majority of the rest of the sales are made up by auctions, sometimes online or on site auctions. Online auctions are becoming more and more popular and it is important when you are bidding on an online system that you are aware that you are either bidding at an auction or you're bidding on a private treaty sale. If it is an auction and you are the highest bidder, you are required to sign contracts that day and hand over 10% deposit. Generally speaking, the rest of the funds are required in four weeks time and closing will happen within four weeks of that auction date. You will need to do all your due diligence in advance, which is costly. You'll also have to know that you have funds in place quickly for that closing date as well. And this is why, generally speaking, cash buyers are attracted to auctions because they can pick up properties at a discount. Sellers at auctions generally sell because there's an issue with the property or they want to sell very quickly. Therefore, if you are bidding on a property that's at auction, you need to be very mindful that there could be an issue with the property and also that you need to have funds to close quite quickly. 
In regards to a private treaty sale, bids are received without the knowledge of other bidders. The process is kind of in its name. It is private. The agent shouldn't be sharing any details about the other bidders other than perhaps the fact that someone's a cash bidder or perhaps the top bid. Generally, there's no set time frame for private treaty sales. Bidding generally only stops when the agent feels that they've absolutely maxed out the price that they can achieve for their client. If bids are accepted at a private treaty sale and property goes sale agreed, nothing is binding until contracts are signed and either party can walk away at any time. Tip number 10, ownership. There are two main forms of ownership in Ireland, freehold and long leasehold. Freehold, basically you own everything above and below that property, including any mineral rights, and no one can cross your land without having a right of way or a leeway in place. Leasehold, you own the property under a long lease, generally 900 years or more. If it's less than this, don't be overly concerned with the date unless your solicitor advises you. In nearly all cases, you can renew that lease so the date doesn't actually matter all that much. Generally, leaseholds are used in apartment blocks because you can't own above you or you can't own below you, so therefore freehold is not an option. Also, apartment blocks generally come with a lot of rules and it's easier to enforce those rules if there's a leasehold in place. Sometimes there is opportunities to buy the freehold on some long leasehold houses, but you need the house to be on its own land and nothing above or below it. Buying out the freehold can take a year or two. The cost or the valuation is based on the ground rent multiplied by the time left on the actual lease itself. Generally, it could cost anywhere from 1000 to 2000 depending on the type of property plus your legal costs. The right to buy out the freehold generally comes down to about seven checks, and as long as you can tick at least two of them, you should be entitled to buy out that freehold. Tip number 11, negotiations. When you find a property you want to bid on, before you actually place your first bid, write down the maximum that you would pay for that property. Write it down and put it in a safe place. It's important to remember that when you are setting that limit for that particular property, that you're setting the limit based on what you feel is the value of that property. It's not your top budget. If the bidding goes beyond that price, take out that piece of paper, read it back to yourself, go, this property was just not for me, there will be others. Let the agent know that you've reached your limit, but if the overbidders decide to pull out for any reason, let the agent know that you're still interested at this price. By doing this, you'll never feel that you've overpaid for a property and you'll reduce that buyer's remorse. Remember that I said, ask the agent as many questions as you possibly can, and if the agent does share any information, personal information of why the seller is actually selling, use that to your advantage. If you're aware that the seller is looking to sell quite quickly, Put that in your bid. Let the agent know that you've already lined up a solicitor, you've already lined up your billing surveyor, and you're ready to sign contracts and close as quickly as possible. If you know the seller is actually in a chain or perhaps wants a long closing date, also include that within your bid. Tell the agent that you're willing to sign contracts quickly, but you're happy for a long closing period. Be as flexible as possible in terms of timing because sometimes time is more valuable than money. One of my first tips was get your team in place early. If you are able to include your solicitor's name and address, your surveyor's name and address as well within your email that is including within your bid, this will put you at the top of the list again with the agent because they'll know you're serious about this and they'll, you'll be front and center in terms of who they think might actually close. If you are aware of any issues with the property, let the agent know that your offer is based on the fact that you are aware of these issues and you're happy to deal with them, even if your solicitor or your surveyor flags them further down the line, that you are happy to take on these issues. Tip number 12, buying a new property. If you are looking at buying a new property or a new build, prices are generally fixed. There's no negotiation and in most cases it's first come first serve. Most new builds will come with some white goods, i.e. your fridge, your washer, your dishwasher, some standard bathrooms and tilings, etc. But you will have to kind of factor in that you will perhaps have to carpet, paint, etc. as well. Unless you are buying the show house, and if you are buying the show house, generally it will cost more. But it is important to remember that if you are buying all the furniture within the show house, that you should separate that from the contract so you avoid paying stamp duty on the furniture. If you are a first time buyer looking at a new bill, this does open up some other opportunities for you in terms of the help to buy scheme and the shared equity grant. There is other videos on this channel, but I'm not gonna get into that in much detail in this video. 
Tip number 13, sale agreed. A lot of people get a little bit confused around this, but once you go sale agreed, you are asked for your booking deposit. This booking deposit is refundable if either party decides to back out at any stage before contracts are signed. At this point, you're generally gonna be asked for your solicitor's details and your surveyor's details to come in and survey the property if you haven't provided that information already. Your solicitor will do all the legal due diligence before you sign contracts. If there are any issues with the title or any issues with the management company, they will advise you accordingly. They'll also advise your lender and the lender solicitor. If everything is in order and you're ready to sign, contracts could be ready to be signed in about four weeks. But generally speaking, it takes a little bit longer for the solicitors to review everything and it more like eight to 10 weeks before contracts are ready to be signed in most cases. Once everything is in order, your solicitor will advise you to come in and sign contracts. They'll guide you through any issues that are outstanding. They'll also look for a 10% deposit for the property as well. Once both parties have signed contracts, the contract is now binding and you could be sued if you try to walk away. Generally speaking, in most cases, once you've signed contracts, the closing date is about four weeks later. This allows four weeks for the solicitors to tie up any loose ends, unless there's some major issues in regards to probate, etc. Tip number 14, the survey. As I said, it is important to build your team beforehand and it's great to have your surveyor ready to go once you've gone sale agreed. When the survey is taking place, try to attend as well. Generally, in most cases, the agent won't mind this. Let the surveyor do their job and look at all the structural issues. But while you're there, maybe open and close all the windows and doors, make sure they open and close, make sure cabinets open and close and wardrobes open and close as well to make sure there's no issues there. Also bring a phone with you with a charger and plug in your phone and make sure all the plug sockets are working as well and go around and turn on and off all the lights to make sure they're all working too. When you do get the building surveyor's report, be mindful that these surveys can read very scary. They are written to protect the surveyor, to make sure that they're covering off absolutely everything. And generally they highlight everything. And sometimes they can highlight things in such a way that they're th items that you need to address in the short, medium and long term. And sometimes perhaps a roof happens to be, pops up in a medium to long term issue and you feel that you were reading this report and the roof needs to be replaced. But generally speaking, it could be in most cases is that the roof might need to be replaced or repaired in five to 10 to 15 years, which would be the case in nearly every single roof. It's important to understand how to read these surveys and if you have any major concerns, ask the surveyor for a quick phone call to go through any major issues. If the survey does flag a major issue that you weren't aware of during the bidding process or wasn't obvious or visible during the bidding process, perhaps you might want a price reduction or a price chip. And this is very understandable. And if it is a major issue, perhaps that price chip or price reduction will be accepted. However, word of warning here, if the bidding has been very competitive, the agent may go back to some of the underbidders and see if they have an interest in the property before they confirm that actual price reduction. If an issue was obvious during the viewings, perhaps a hole in the roof or a very bad leak, and it was quite obvious that there was an issue during viewings and during the bidding process, a price chip at that point won't go down that well. If you are buying a new house, you should also get a snag list. In Ireland, secondhand homes generally are being sold as is. 99% of the buyers won't make any changes even if there is a survey done. They just won't make any changes. The property is being sold as is. However, with new builds, a snag list should also be done so a builder can fix any issues with the property before the property is completed or even up to maybe six months after you've taken occupation. New builds also come with a home bond guarantee for 10 years. Generally speaking, I don't think they're worth the paper they're written on. They're more of a marketing tool. So it is important to get a survey done as well as getting a snag list done. However, with new builds, generally speaking, it's very difficult to see any issues with a home very early on because some issues may take two or three years to show themselves because of settlement and everything else that happens with a new build. I'll give you a personal example of this. I bought a new build in 2013 and a leak showed up four years later. This leak actually started to happen during construction. A nail was nailed into a pipe under the floor, under the concrete floor, and as the water was passing through the nail, the nail eventually rusted away, and four years later, the leak started to show up as the water started to raise through the concrete. So with new builds, it's very hard to see any issues on day one. What's probably more important than a survey is actually the builder's track record. Number 15, contents. 
homes in Ireland are sold without the contents you're just buying the four walls so blinds fridges furniture etc aren't included within the bidding price so some buyers do get a little bit annoyed when they see these items removed the price agreed is for the house not the contents if you want the contents included you clearly need to state it within your offer you can also agree a price for the content separately and when you're doing up the contract for sale it's a good idea to strip out any of the contents from the sale agreed price because that avoids paying stamp duty on contents because there's no necessarily need to pay stamp duty on any of the contents. So this brings us almost to the end in terms of closing and perhaps some of the costs associated with buying in Ireland. So in terms of the closing, when it comes to the closing date, what I would recommend is that you have funds in place in advance of that closing date. Properties in Ireland do sell with VP or vacant possession. So it's important to check that the property is vacant and all the personal belongings have been removed from the seller. It's a good idea to ask the agent to go and check the day before or the day of closing. On the day of closing, you should get keys for the property as well as any alarm codes. You should also get meter readings from the agent in terms of gas and electricity and details how to transfer them into your name. I also believe it's a good idea to have a locksmith arranged so you can change the locks on the property as well. In terms of the cost of buying property in Ireland, obviously you will have the price of the property that's been agreed. You will also perhaps have mortgage arrangement fees in terms of your broker fees from anywhere from about 100 to 500. You also have solicitors fees generally around 1% of the property, but can range from about 2,000 to 5,000 depending on the property itself. Residential stamp duty is 1% of the property price up to a million and 2% of anything there over. Billing surveyors fees range from about 500 to 1,000 depending on the type of property and the size of the property there could be additional surveys required if it's an old property perhaps there might be an asbestos survey required or perhaps there might be a drain survey also required but you can add in about five or six hundred euro for that as well so say you buy a five thousand euro property you want to budget anywhere between eight to ten thousand for additional costs buying a home in ireland is not rocket science but people are getting paralyzed by trying to gather so much information, trying to learn every aspect of the market, trying to become legal and mortgage experts, and they're getting bogged down in this information or getting paralyzed by this information and they're not actually getting anywhere. One of my top tips would be to build a team, a solicitor, a surveyor, a broker, perhaps a contractor if you're planning to look at houses that need a lot of work, and then focus your valuable time on what matters, getting out there, viewing properties and putting bids on properties. You can't ever buy a home if you don't put bids on it. And I feel that you have to go out to look at 100 properties to put on 10 bids to be successful in one. And you have to get out there first and foremost to start looking at properties. Hopefully some of these tips will aid you in your search. But what I would recommend is you just get out there and start viewing properties. Please, hopefully you've got some value out of the channel. You might like this video, subscribe to the channel. And as always, thanks for watching.